of uh, Didymos asteroid system after the impact uh, using robotic telescopes, uh, open data sets, and math. And uh, Ron uh, McNaughton will give us a short presentation on the mystery of the Martian flares. Uh, Tom Luton, our president, will close the meeting as usual with announcements. If you have, presentation, uh, if you have uh, questions for our presenters, uh, please ask them in the YouTube uh, chat box and Emma will ask your questions uh, to the speaker on your behalf. And if you're uh, joining us for the first time, uh, whether you're a member or not, please uh, say hello through the chat box and let us know where you're from. So let's get the meeting started with um, Arnold and the sky this month. Well, thank you, Paul. And hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you from my home in Whitby, about an hour east of downtown Toronto. As I look up at the stars from my home, I do so in the, in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas, a branch of the greater Anishinaabe nation, which includes Algonquin, Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. Here we go. Now I'll be showing the sky as it appears from Toronto and times will be for the Eastern time zone which changes from daylight saving to standard time in just a few days. I'll be suggesting a number of targets in the southern sky and on the moon included in these five observing programs for beginner and intermediate level observers. Search RASC Observing to learn more and download the list of objects for each of these programs. Lists for deep space objects include their RA and DEC coordinates. Here are some highlights for the month. The moon comes close to three planets this month. Three meteor showers will be peaking. Daylight savings ends this coming Sunday. There's a total lunar eclipse on the 8th. Later in the month, there is an opposition with Uranus. A night sky, I'm sorry, a night with multiple events with Jupiter's moons 
And there's an excellent opportunity to watch Algol rebrighten from a minimum. The nighttime window is generous in November. Tonight, night starts at 7.45 p.m. and ends at 6.18 in the morning for a total of about 10 and a half hours of uh, night. By the end of the month, night starts around 6.30. That's Eastern Standard Time and lasts almost an hour longer by the end of the month. Astronomical twilight, when the sky is dark enough to view planets, that adds about an half hour before and after night. The beginning of November has the moon growing full and washing out deep space targets with the full beaver or frost moon occurring on the 8th when it glides through Earth's shadow. By the third weekend in November, let's say the 19th, 20th, that's when the moon starts to become less of a problem as it becomes a new moon by the 23rd. I'll, when we do uh, some slides coming up on deep sky observing, I'll be suggesting that we do it on the 19th because that's when the moon will be mostly out of the way. And when the month ends, it will be a first quarter moon. So now we will observe the sky facing south. And on the third weekend, we can hunt for some deep space targets in four of the constellations that cross the meridian at as night begins, Aquarius, Pegasus, Pisces, and Cetus. We'll start with two Messier objects. With the Sagittarius arm of the Milky Way nearby in the west, there are some globular clusters hovering over it, like M15 off the nose of Pegasus. It was discovered in 1746 by Jean-Dominique Maraldi and included in Charles Messier's catalog 18 years later. The globular cluster is around 12.5 billion years old and lies 35,700 light years away. Yet, it is so brilliant at magnitude 6.2 that it lies on the cusp of naked eye visibility from perfectly dark locations. M15 is one of the most densely packed globulars. Its center has undergone a core collapse and may have a central black hole. A six, a six inch or larger telescope will resolve some of its halo stars. 13 degrees south of M15 or four and a half degrees north of Beta Aquarii lies globular cluster M2. It was also discovered by Maraldi in 1746 and is one of the largest known globular clusters. It lies even further than M15 at 55,000 light years, but is almost as bright as mag at magnitude uh, 6.5. It is also one of the oldest of all globulars at 13 billion years old. In a telescope with sufficient magnification, you can resolve some of the oldest stars in the universe. Let's take a look at a couple of double stars. 3 Pegasi is a double star 3.5 degrees south-southwest of Epsilon Pegasi. The two components are magnitude 6.2 and 7.7, are separated by 39 arc seconds from our viewpoint, and both are on the main sequence. The stars are 285 light years away. The brighter component is a blue-white class A star. Our second double is 77 Piscium, found three degrees south, southeast of Epsilon Piscium. The term double applies perfectly to this pair. Both components are main sequence stars of classification of five, which makes them one class brighter and hotter than our sun, and both are around two billion years old. They are true binaries with a 61-year orbital period. They lie about eight light years from each other and about 140 light years from us. Turning to the finest NGC program, there's a very interesting galaxy found less than one half a degree northwest of a line connecting Delta and Omega Ceti. NGC 936 is a barred lenticular galaxy 50 to 60 million light years from our sun 
it has an angular size of 4.4 arc minutes. There are no spiral arms in lenticular galaxies, and this galaxy has very little new star formation. But we do see a ring of stars that connect to and are brightest at the ends of the bar. This gives the galaxy the appearance of a TIE fighter from the Star Wars movies and the nickname Darth Vader's Galaxy. Our other NGC target is 7009, the Saturn Nebula. You can find it four and a half degrees east-southeast of Epsilon Aquarii. The planetary nebula was discovered by William Herschel in 1782 from Dachet, England. The nebula is an expanding shell of gas that leaves the core of the now dead star exposed. The core is 55,000 degrees Kelvin and is emitting strong ultraviolet radiation that excites the nebula to glow. Some may detect a greenish or yellow glow in, the, in modest telescopes. The nebula's distinctive Saturn-like appearance comes from its many halo jet-like streams and multiple shells of gas, giving the nebula a round, appearance, a round appearance with two jets imitating Saturn's rings edge on. This nebula glows at magnitude 8. Its distance is not well known. It's anywhere from two to 4,000 light years away. There's a great opportunity on November 22nd to watch the eclipsing binary star Elgol rebrighten from its minimum magnitude of 3.4 matching nearby Alpha Triangulae up to its usual bright 2.08 matching nearby Gamma Andromedae. Perseus with Elgol will be climbing up towards the zenith that night so you will be looking through less and less atmosphere as it climbs higher, and the moon will be new. So conditions couldn't be better for making magnitude estimates with neighboring stars. When dimmer Algol B passes in front of A, the amount of light we see from Algol drops by a whopping 75%. That's easy to notice. But when B goes behind A, the dip is too small to notice visually. The stars are so close together, they orbit each other once every 2.7 days. Now here's a light curve of the drop in Elgol's brightness. When B eclipses A, the light will drop from magnitude 2.04 down to 3.4 before it rising up again. The dip when B goes behind A, shown here on the light curve, is just too small to notice visually. Now, if you head out on November the 22nd around 7 p.m., Elgol will be in mid-eclipse, B in front of A, and its light at minimum. Compare it to Alpha Trianguli. After observing a deep space object, take another look at Elgol. Is it now as bright as Rho Persei, the star next to Elgol? Throughout the night, you can watch it match the brightness of neighboring stars as it climbs the scale. You can find comparison charts for Algol like this one online to help you. Now we turn our attention closer to home, the planet, starting with the inner solar system. Throughout November, while Earth is orbiting on one side of the sun, the innermost planets Mercury and Venus are hiding behind the other side. At the same time, Earth is nicely positioned next to Mars as we orbit up alongside it. By the end of November, Earth is only a week away from passing across the line that connects the Sun and Mars, which will bring us as close as we can get to the tiny planet on this orbit. Here we see Mercury and Venus emerging from behind the Sun as they head to the east throughout the month. By the end of November, they might be far enough east to be visible in the west after sunset. And this would be the view at the end of the month. Once the sun has gone down, wait for the sun to get below the horizon before you attempt this. Venus will be fairly bright at magnitude almost negative four, and Mercury bright at negative point three, uh, point six, and they are both about uh, three degrees above the horizon, so you will need a perfectly clear view to the west, maybe up on a balcony, or maybe where the ground drops off to the west so you have an unobstructed view to give this a try.
Mars spends the month of November traveling in retrograde motion east to west between the horns of Taurus the bull. Its magnitude will climb slightly from negative 1.1 to 1.4 by the end of the month. Its angular size will grow from a tiny 15.4 arc seconds to a slightly better 17.2. But the best feature is the fact that it's going to be up high in the sky. It's already 70, 70 degrees up. It'll get to 71 degrees by the end of the month. And that's a big deal because the less atmosphere you look through, the more detail you're going to be able to observe from, um, from Mars. As I say, it's right now at altitude 70 degrees. So you're looking through just a little bit more than one atmosphere, 1.06. Now, you may remember that uh, Mars had a really close opposition in 2003 when it was a generous 24 five arc seconds wide. But at that time, we had to look through two atmospheres. It was only 30 degrees up because it was summertime when the ecliptic is low at night. But this time, Mars will be much higher. It'll be smaller, 17.2 arc seconds. But what we lose in angular size, we pick up in clarity, being higher up, less atmosphere, less air pollution, less light pollution, less turbulence to look through, your chances of seeing some detail are better. And to help you see some details, you might want to use colored filters. Now, yellow and neodymium will provide contrast enhancements on any of the planets. But when it comes to Mars, you might want to try an orange one. And here's why. Here's a look at the albedo features without a filter, and they are a bit darker the filter. You can even see the a polar cap with this filter used. You're going to have to use a lot of magnification to see the detail on Mars. You're going Here we see a simulated view with a 10-inch mirror, a rather powerful eyepiece at 5 millimeter, and even with a 2x power mate to boost the image up to this size where you can start to see the albedo Beto features such as Certus Major, seen here, pointing upside down because it's a daub. Other, like here's Certus Major, there's Hellas Basin, and there's the Arabia Terra, the large uh, red patch behind Certus Major. Two other albedo features are Sinus Mer Meridiani and Argyre Planidia. And to help you see these dark features, you will want to give that orange filter a try. Now out to the outer solar system. Here we see the path of Earth during the month of November. You can see that it's crossing a line between the Sun and Uranus. We cross that line on November the 8th. Meanwhile, we, we are pulling away from Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune. So these will be getting, uh, Jupiter and Saturn will become noticeably smaller during the month. And you can notice that uh, it appears Jupiter and Neptune are on the same line of sight from Earth, so they should appear close together in the sky. Uh, you don't need any finder charts or help finding Jupiter. All you, all you have to do is go out as soon as it's dark, face south, and it's the brightest point in the sky. As I was saying, we're pulling away from Jupiter, so its angular size will drop by a little over 8% during the month. Its magnitude drops a little bit as well. Its altitude at the meridian is a fairly good uh, 44 degrees, about halfway up, so we're not looking through two atmospheres to see it, and that'll help us see some detail. And to help you see the details with Jupiter, give a blue filter a try. It will help uh, hi highlight the contrast of its cloud belts and red spot, as noticed here. There, there the northern belt seems more contrasty, and the red spot pops out a little bit better. Now, I was mentioning that there are some very interesting events happening on the moon, uh, with the moons of Jupiter on the 16th of November. Here we see Europa currently in transit. You can't see it when it's in front, but you will see it when it pops out into view. And its shadow will be approaching and crossing onto Jupiter 
just before Io pops into view from hiding behind Jupiter's shadow and Ganymede will begin to transit. All of that's going to happen, bang, 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 in real close sequence. So let's keep an eye on it now. Here we uh, keep your eye here. Uh, Europa's shadow will be entering any moment now. There it is. Io pops into view. Ganymede begins to transit, and all of that takes place within 14 minutes. And by 11 o'clock at night, Europa pops back into view. So that's four events in 26 minutes. Not bad. Hopefully we have a clear night, and you can give this a try. Now we are pulling away from Saturn. It's going to be shrinking by about uh, not quite 5% during the month as its magnitude also decreases. Uh, its angular size for its globe and rings are, are shrinking, as you can see here between the 3rd and 30th. And there is no altitude at meridian because Saturn is already west of the meridian at, at nightfall. Observing Saturn, well, you're definitely going to want to use a Barlow to bump its size up. We're getting pretty close to the end of the observing season for Saturn, so give it a try while you can, because um, our next opportunity will have to wait until the summertime. And if you are giving it a try, try using a yellow filter. The faint cloud bands on Saturn are slightly more noticeable with a yellow filter. Uranus will uh, be in opposition this month, and it is about 14 degrees southwest of uh, the Pleiades, or to the right of the Pleiades if you're out around 9 o'clock on that 19th of November. Here I'm going to show you Uranus in a field of visible stars. So you should be able to see these stars without the help of binoculars, as well as Uranus, because it is at magnitude 5.7, brighter than the traditional cutoff we use of magnitude 6 for visibility. When you do see it in a pair of binoculars or a scope, you will notice that Uranus has a definitive round disk shape, unlike the star you see next to it there that is a shapeless point of light that may also be flickering if there's turbulence in the, uh, in the atmosphere above us. Neptune, as we suspected, would be close to Jupiter in the night sky. It is found halfway between Jupiter and Phi Aquarii. In magnification, it too will represent a round disk. Here is the suggested view in binoculars, but I think you'll probably need a telescope to detect the disk shape of that very tiny spot. Now, much closer to home, down to uh, up to the sun, I should say, uh, here we have videos of the sun that were taken earlier today by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. On the left, we see the transfer of energy between the chromosphere and the sun's corona. On the right, the light of ion 9, that's iron without eight of its usual 26 electrons. Uh, it shows the activity in the corona, such as magnetic loops and outflowing material. And here we see the currently numbered active regions with 3131 rotating away and 3135 aimed right at us, uh, the most prominent of them. The number of sunspots are developing at a greater rate than what was predicted for this cycle 25. The chances for auroras go up with solar activity. Visit auroraforecast.com to get aurora predictions for the next three nights. Activity levels range from 5, which is moderate, to 7 or active, tonight, tomorrow night, and Friday night. On to the moon. Let's watch how the moon rocks and rolls this month. The northeastern limb of the moon tilts in our favor at the start of the month. There is an eclipse on the 8th. Apogee occurs on the 14th. Southwest librations occur after the last quarter. Perigee happens on the 26th of November. And the month ends with the moon a perfect first quarter. Maybe the top highlight of the month is a total eclipse of the moon, the last we will be able to see until 2025. 
You'll have to get up early and outside by 4 a.m. on Tuesday, November 8, to see it. The moon will be low in the west as it enters totality. For Toronto, the moon will be in twilight for the end of totality and will slip below the horizon during the partial phase of the eclipse. Because the moon will be low while totally eclipsed, photographers can incorporate a foreground scene to frame the blood red moon as dawn slowly illuminates the sky and foreground. Uranus will photobomb your picture. This is a great opportunity if the weather cooperates. Here are the three times the moon comes close to the planets this month. The moon is close to Jupiter in two nights, even closer to Mars one week later. And on the 28th, the moon is kind of close to Saturn, six degrees between them. If you are out observing the moon when close to Saturn on the 28th, you can study the moon for features in the Explore the Moon program. And here we see how the moon will look that night through SkyMaster 15 by 70 binoculars. The binocular version of ETM includes Mare Nectaris, the Sea of Nectar. This is the smallest of the moon's named mares at 350 kilometers wide. On the northern shoreline of Mare Nectaris is crater Theophilus in the telescope version of ETM. The tel uh, Theophilus is a large crater, 100 kilometers wide and 3 kilometers deep. The crater overlaps crater Sirius to its southwest, which tells us Theophilus is younger. The crater has an imposing central mountain that reaches 1.4 kilometers high and features four peaks. The walls of the crater are terraced and show signs of landslip or avalanches. If you study this crater on November 28, you will see its central mountain peaks reach up into sunlight while the crater's floor is still in darkness. There are three meteor showers that peak in November. The first two are the south torrids that peak on November 5 and the north torrids a week later. Both the south and north torrids don't have much of a peak, maybe five per hour. Both showers overlap and run to mid-November, so you might catch some on any clear night the next two weeks. When the south torrids peak, the moon will be near and fat, washing out the fainter meteors. When the north torrids peak a week later, a fat gibbous moon will be rising, again washing out faint streaks. Although the number of meteors may be low, there appears to be a seven-year frequency for fireballs with one possibly occurring this year, and that would help. The south torrid meteors come from debris shed by comet Enki, which has the shortest orbital period of known comets, only 3.3 years. It's believed comet Enki broke apart, producing a number of large asteroids, one being the source of the north torrid meteors. The Leonid shower is the third to peak in November, this one in the morning of the 19th. The Leonids are debris from comet uh, Temple Tuttle, which has a 33-year orbit. The shower is prolific, known for producing a high number of meteors. In fact, in the, in the 1800s, there were three meteor storms that filled the sky with thousands of, of meteors an hour. In the great meteor storm of 1833, also called the night the stars fell, more than 72,000 meteors an hour began raining down over the Americas after midnight on a moonless night. Imagine the spectacle with no moon or streetlights. The storm of 1833 launched a scientific inquiry into what causes meteor showers, eventually establishing the link between showers and comets. Today, we can use computers to model the paths of comets and their trails of debris and the gravitational effects the planets impose on both and make predictions. According to astronomer Mikhail Maslov, the 2022 shower could be impressive. He predicts activity can reach a maximum zenith hourly rate of 250 to 300 meteors compared to the usual 10, 15, or 20. He also predicts brightness will be much higher than the average level, maybe because the pieces will be larger. Because the radiant is in the east after midnight, it is in the direction where our orbit around the sun is taking us. 
We are plowing headfirst into the debris. So Leonid meteors impact our atmosphere at 72 kilometers a second, creating long and bright streaks. The moon won't, won't rise until 2 a.m. and it will be a waning crescent, 23% illuminated. And we'll finish with a comet that is approaching us and beginning to grow a tail. It's comet C2022 E3 ZTF. ZTF stands for Zwicky Transient Facility, located at the Palomar Observatory in California. They used a wide field camera to survey the northern skies once every two nights. That's what uh, they use a wide field camera to survey the sky every two nights helping to find near-Earth asteroids that could pose a threat, and even they discover some distant supernovae. It's thanks to the Virtual Telescope Project in Europe for capturing this image just two weeks ago. The comet is approaching us from the northwest above our orbital plane. It will come closest to the sun on January the 12th and closest to Earth only three weeks later, at a distance of only 43 million kilometers, that's one third of an AU, or one third of the average Earth's sun distance. And at that time, it will be seen fairly high north, uh, 26 degrees from Polaris. Now the comet is expected to become bright enough for easy spotting of binoculars as it passes close to the sun and approaches Earth. Optimistic predictions have it bright enough for you to see by eyes alone. And it's uh, been a long time since we've had a naked eye comet. For November, you can catch the comet in telescopes in the west after sunset, cruising around a degree south of Delta Coronae Borealis. E3 is about uh, magnitude 11. Uh, that was the measurement uh, recorded back in late October, so it might be a little, little bit brighter now. I think you'll need about eight inches of aperture to see the comet now, but hopefully it will be binocular visible real soon. The comet will become circumpolar in mid-January so it can be seen all night. By then, will it have become a naked eye delight as it uh, races through? And that's a wrap. Are there any questions? I need sound, please. There we go. I was waiting for my mic to be unmuted. Thank you very much, Arnold. Great presentation, and I really like those graphics that you used in your slides. Really, really well done. Um, Emma, do we have any questions for Arnold? Nope, we didn't get any questions tonight. Oh, no questions. Okay. Well, that's easy. <laughs> yes, I think it was a very detailed presentation. Left, no questions. Okay, thanks again, Arnold. <laughs> Appreciate the time. I know it takes a long time to present uh, to prepare the presentations. You're welcome, Paul. Thank you. Great. So we'll move on to our next speaker, and that's uh, Frank Dempsey, and he'll tell us about um, his recent merry-go-round uh, observatory project. Take it away, Frank. Okay, thanks, Paul. And I'm broadcasting from Pickering, Ontario. And the title of the presentation is about my merry-go-round observatory that I've been working on for the past several years. And so the story begins, or this presentation begins, with um, a question that somebody posted on an astronomy forum a few years ago, asking if anybody had built uh, these merry-go-round observatories that were first pub publicized or actually built by Leslie Peltier quite a few years ago. And so um, let's um, have a quick look at um, a page from um, Scientific American magazine from decades ago where he called it the Merry Go Round Observatory, or at least that's what the magazine editor wanted to call it. And so we could start off by saying, uh, is everybody familiar with who Leslie Peltier is? Maybe not since he um, uh, passed away uh, a few decades ago and he was well known before that. So just as a quick note about Leslie Peltier, he was a famous comet discoverer and amateur astronomer and variable star observer for the AVSO or American Association of Variable Star Observers. And so he was pretty active uh, as an amateur astronomer with his backyard telescopes and backyard observatory. So that's just a quick background of who Leslie Pelche was. He was well known years ago. Um, he might be best known for a book that he, he wrote, authored, called Starlight Nights. 
and the book Starlight Nights is now out of print, but probably exists in quite a few astronomy club libraries. So anyway, uh, let's have a quick look at a, a closer illustration in that um, uh, uh, magazine article um, about his uh, uh, observatory. So you can probably see at a glance, it seems to be a circular track on the ground and has a frame that rotates on top of it. Four wheels, it looks like in this case. Um, the notes at the bottom left indicate it's from a children's merry-go-round. And so it's probably from the era when uh, they might have been from, say, Sears catalog or something like that. And um, people would buy them and build them for the children. And of course, um, uh, the steel structure would be left lying around after children uh, stopped being children and they were long gone and moved away. And maybe these were surplus and Leslie Pelche found one and put it to use. And he's got some other surplus parts here, automotive parts, maybe steering wheel and uh, seat maybe. But the point here is that he has a platform rotating on a circular track. And he has a telescope mounted on uh, a framework that allows him to basically sit still or, or at least move around in his chair and observe the sky, whether he's observing comets or variable stars. And the hut rotates, and that's one way to um, uh, move the telescope wherever you want it. So that's what he did, and that's become known as the Merry Go Round Observatory. So a lot of details in here about um, um, the um, you know opening of the um, uh, hut and where it's going to be pointed and how to um, balance the telescope and so on. I should point out um, one little detail is that the telescope mentioned here is a six inch refractor. And um, uh, I have a six inch refractor, a six inch F8 refractor, and it's pretty darn heavy. And it requires a pretty substantial amount to hold it. So I'm a little um, uh, surprised to see it's uh, this fairly light framework holding a six inch telescope. Anyway, that's that. So um, some details to, to point out, it's an enclosed hut rotating on a circular track. The telescope is mounted on an altazimuth type mount in front of the seated observer. And your observer manually turns a wheel to turn the structure. So the hut rotates. There's some other details there too, but um, those are the main details that are, are in the merry-go-round observatory. And so couldn't say why. And so um, I see it as being for visual observing only. Uh, fine for a comet hunter, uh, somebody that, you know, looked for comets half a century ago with um, an altazimuth mounted telescope scanning um, scanning the sky near the horizon, for instance, or observing variable stars or other stars. Anyway, for visual observing. Um, and an enclosed hut reduces hassles for observing like biting insects and dew and wind chill, which can be a, a nuisance. So if you can reduce them with an enclosed hut, uh, that's a great advantage and great reason to build um, some sort of observatory. Um, now, I said it's for <clears throat> visual observing, but if you don't like uh, star hopping with star charts, then you don't have to waste your time doing that. You can simply buy an automatic telescope. Here's one from Unicellar, uh, waiting to take your money, take thousands of dollars, and save you the trouble of bothering to uh, star hop your way around the sky looking for targets. So you can go this option if you want to, but otherwise, as I mentioned, um, this project is for visual observing and it requires star hopping and charts, and it's not for uh, photographic or imaging, and it's not a high power planetary sort of telescope. Anyway, um, onto my version. Um, my concept was when I set aside set aside some time and a little bit of budget to try to build one, um, it, it would be made of wood, which is low cost, easy to work with, and I have lots of scrap wood lying around to use. And in my case, the platform could rotate on caster wheels sitting on the ground. That's because I happen to have a few wheels uh, lying around surplus from some other project. And the hut would sit on the platform with a telescope mounted on the side of the hut. So that sounds straightforward. So my initial plan was to use an old equatorial mount, and just simply mount it to one side of the wall um, from one, one side of the hut, which isn't built yet. So it's just a platform. And here I've got an A-frame uh, mounted to the platform. Um, the hut, you know, the observatory or hut, whether it's a frame holding a mosquito netting or um, a plywood structure or whatever, it's all trivial compared to the initial problem of building a rotating platform. Anyway, here you see the A-frame on the side and um, the um, equatorial mount is mounted onto that. And you see a bar here, it's placed diagonally um, on which the telescope would mount, be mounted and approximately at eye level for a seated observer on that platform. And there's some slow motion controls on it. So that's the first uh, version that I built. And so it seemed okay. So this little telescope here is a four inch reflector that I built. Um, 
convenient little size telescope, not very heavy, um, works pretty well. And this is one version. So you can see how the um, sheet of plywood uh, on the base just, uh, you can't see the wheels in this image, but you can in the next image. Um, it rotates, turns around, the A-frame will eventually have a hut built around it and hold the telescope. And that's my version for how to uh, build a merry go round observatory. So, um, and then some other details here, um, you can see how these three caster wheels are sitting on the ground on its own separate little platform. And there's a pivot bar going up through the middle, serving as a pivot so that the platform will simply rotate around that pivot on the wheels and the wheels will support it. So the wheels are heavy duty enough. They, they did a reasonable job. So nothing bent or flexed or got into any problems. And so that worked pretty well, or at least it seemed to work reasonably well with trials with that little telescope and my body weight sitting on the chair. So it worked pretty well. Um, so um, it seems okay and it works and it rotates without problem. There's no turning mechanism installed yet. You know, that's simply a matter of installing some pulleys or possibly a bicycle chain or a rope with pulleys to turn the, turn the platform. Um, vibrations are minor and acceptable. There are some vibrations, of course. Um, you know, my, if I look at high enough magnification, you can see my um, pulse and heartbeat shaking through the telescope. But the telescope can point, be pointed at most of the sky without problem, maybe not so near the horizon. But um, so it's worthwhile to check into any other versions that might have existed that people might have built. And so, yes, um, this is the Bill Volna version uh, from the 1980s, early 1990s. And so he was an observer in uh, Minnesota who built this uh, version. It's actually a little trailer that he pulled around with his pickup truck and set up, um, erected. And that telescope on the side is a six inch refractor. And so, um, I mentioned that my, my own six inch refractor, uh, bead refractor is heavy duty enough. It requires a substantial structure to hold it. And that's fine uh, because Bill spent two or three years building this according to the Sky and Telescope article, also in telescope making. Um, um, one point to, um, to illustrate before I move on to the next slide is that one feature here is that the um, eyepiece is fixed. So the eyepiece stays at a fixed position in front of his observer where you see him, him seated on his chair or bench inside. Um, the, uh, it's a really handy feature to have the eyepiece at a fixed level. So you can see some more details here. Um, the Sky and Telescope article indicated how it's made of welded steel and it took several years, years to build it. And I agree that it's gotta be pretty heavy duty to hold that six inch refractor. Anyway, that is one version, um, the Bill Volner version from um, early 1990s. Um, there were several other versions I noticed in Sky and Telescope. Um, somebody in Colorado built um, a rotating structure and held, held a big Dobsonian, maybe 13 or 16 inch sort of Dobsonian. Um, and that's uh, one version. I saw another article where somebody built a welded steel track similar to the um, original merry-go-round observatory. It's a lot of work in my opinion. So, but that's fine. This is, um, this is one way of doing it. So anyway, um, back to my version. Uh, made of wood and so on. Um, I noticed uh, you, can, you can find a lot of images online for Dobsonian style binocular holders. And so I started to look into that and to make some for my own binoculars. And I ended up with making this. Instead of having the uh, little equatorial mount mounted on the A-frame, I put a little shelf and mounted this little Dobsonian style mount. And then I like the idea of the fixed eyepiece. And so here I've got the eyepiece from that small Newtonian telescope, in this case is the five inch telescope, um, uh, aligned uh, right through the um, right through the um, altitude bearing of the Dobsonian mount here. So that's pretty handy. It, it is a fixed eyepiece position. So that's pretty handy. Um, so I like this better than the equatorial mount. So uh, this allows some movement um, in, in azimuth so that wherever it's pointed, I don't need to rotate the hut to turn it say five degrees. It can gain about, um, 20 or 30 degrees uh, of azimuth along the horizon turning just on this little dub mounted um, tiny little platform here. So here's a few more details to give you some idea of what I mean. Um, it's just a dub mount, uh, can rotate on that little shelf mounted onto the A-frame uh, uh, on the side of the hut. And it's, um, I could point out also it's a three point dub instead of a four point, but minor detail there. Uh, so those are some little details of it. And you see a few more details here with, um, the uh, small reflector and it mounts balances pretty well and it's it's easy to, to balance a small telescope there but it just gives you some idea of how its uh, telescope is mounted there so um, that's all straightforward um, 
But a bit later, I realized I could just use that little Altazimuth daub mount on a separate tripod. And so a little tripod with that mount on it is portable and much less work and cost and maintenance than actually building it onto the side of a hut. So um, here's my current situation. So um, in this case, it's got a pair of binoculars. Um, so you see a Vixen cell dovetail mounted onto the binoculars. Um, a dovetail base on the um, dog base and um, it's sitting on a tripod and I just carry the, uh, in this case, binoculars uh, mounted onto that dog, um, dog cell mount, just plunk it down onto the cradle on the tripod. Uh, similar for other telescopes, I may have a few other pictures of some other telescopes, four and five inch style Newtonians. Uh, but anyway, that gives you some idea of my current setup. And I find it pretty easy to use, pretty easy, uh, pretty portable to use and plunk it down anywhere. Um, so uh, a few more images here, just give you some idea of the unit in operation. And um, there are some trees around. So the top image shows the, um, um, plat the uh, uh, little um, patio stone platform I had um, designated to use for that, um, that little uh, merry-go-round merry observatory if I built it. And I have a few other of my other telescopes in the background. And there are um, uses for telescope observatories when you have um, bigger telescopes that are not really intended to be portable. They can just sit in a little hut on their little stone. And so there is room for, for that in my property. I could put it here, but there are trees around. Um, there is light pollution. There, is, there are good reasons why it's easier to carry around that little uh, tripod mounted unit, and plunk it down anywhere I want. So it's actually quite a bit easier to use that way. And so um, if, if I ask, is the merry-go-round observatory um, worthwhile or feasible? And so, um, yes, it could be stable enough for visual observations. As I mentioned, for uh, I, may, I may have mentioned for variable star observations and double star observations, it would be pretty good. Um, as long as it's not intended to be used for, you know, too high of a magnification, which you can't normally use on uh, an altazimuth mount anyway. But um, building, building a hut requires some construction cost and maintenance and ground space. And that's fine, maybe uh, it's worthwhile. I could do that, but maybe it's worthwhile, maybe not. But it probably was a good idea when surplus children's merry-go-round tracks were common. As I said, may have mentioned, maybe they were from the Sears catalog or something, you know, half a century ago. Maybe they were more common, um, but maybe they were uh, pieces of scrap metal left lying around eventually to be picked up and used for some purpose. So. Maybe in that case, it might have been worthwhile to, to build this. In my case, um, I decided the um, portable tripod version is, is easy to use and it's really fun to use for small telescopes, five inches and smaller. So it's quite convenient. So for my circumstances, I decided that the portable tripod version is preferable to the hut. And that's why I didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, that's why I didn't go any further on that merry-go-round observatory. So it's not totally scrap. Um, I could continue with it someday. But uh, for now, I decided um, uh, using my binoc binoculars and small telescopes is much more fun to use on that little um, portable uh, tripod version than uh, building it on a stationary hut. So that's the presentation. And if anybody has any comments um, or questions or suggestions, uh, I'll be glad to hear them. Anyway, that's the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Frank. And uh, we typically go to questions, but I'm told that Frank's internet connection just dropped. So we won't be able to take any questions uh, right now. If it comes back, please let me know. Um, we'll continue then with our next speaker, and that's uh, Arushi Nath. And uh, she presented to us last month on the Didymos asteroid system impact. Um, and she spoke about what happened before the impact. Tonight, she's going to talk to us about after the impact. So take it away, Arushi. Great, thank you. So my name is Arushi, and I'm in downtown Toronto. And today, I'm going to be talking about my photometric observations of the Didyma system after the impact. So just a quick recap on the DART mission. So this was a planetary defense test mission. Um, launched to the Didymos asteroid system um, to try and test out um, the deflection method of a kinetic impactor. So um, on 26th of November, um, the DART mission impacted the moonlet of Didymos called Dimorphos, um, and it was able to successfully impact, which was actually the first goal of this mission. 
but there's also three other goals um, of the DARK mission. The second one was to cause at least a 73 second change in the orbital period of the dimorphous around the Deimos. And this was definitely very successful. Um, the orbital period was changed um, over 25 times the predicted amount. So it was changed by around 32 minutes. The third goal was to measure the change um, in the binary period um, to an uncertainty of 7.3 seconds or less. This goal was also achieved. And the fourth goal, which is still pending right now, um, is to measure the momentum transfer efficiency of the dark impact. So um, both system scientists and professional astronomers have been observing the Didyma system um, before impact to measure um, the baseline of the rotational and orbital period of the Didyma system during the impact to measure the change in magnitude of the Deimos, of the Deimos system, as well as to see um, any tails that are coming from the ejecta of the impact, and also post-impact to measure the changes in the orbital period um, and other changes that might have happened after the dark mission impacted. So um, these are different um, sources um, from different observatories um, that have captured the um, the Moss uh, when it was impacted by the DART. So um, this is from space telescopes like the Hubble and the James Webb, um, but also from ground-based telescopes like the Atlas and the LCO Observatory. Um, I was also able to find um, ultraviolet um, information from the NASA Swift Space Telescope um, during the impact. So um, during the impact, there was a sharp raise in radioactivity um, caused by the impact. And actually, um, in the bottom right figure, you'll see uh, this change. And you'll see two circles on the image. Um, the red one is of the Diddy Moss. And um, the other one above it, um, orange, um, is for the background noise. So um, the Dark Vision team has also been observing um, the Diddy Moss system every day after the impact. Um, but I want to point out two interesting days, this September 29th and October 4th, where they were also able to include mutual events um, in their observations. And you can see from the bottom two graphs, um, in gray, you can see the arrow saying um, the expected uh, mutual event time um, based on the period of the previous period of 11 hours and 55 minutes. Um, but from the new period of orbital period of 11 hours and 23 minutes, you can see um, the mutual event was observed in a different place, both on September 29th and on October 4th, showing the successful change um, in the orbital period. So how do you measure um, the differential photometry of asteroids? So first, telescopes have um, a camera attached to them, and this camera is receiving um, proton, sorry, um, this photons um, from the sky. And the more photons one pixel receives, um, the brighter it will be. And if we create a boundary of the object that we're looking at, in this case, the DEMOS, then we are able to find um, the total brightness of the whole object. Um, in the left image, you can see that there's three circles here. Um, in the middle, this is where we're actually observing the object. And on the outer ring, this um, is nothing to do with the object, actually. This is just observing the noise that's coming out that's coming from the image so that um, we know how much noise is in the observation and you can subtract it to find the actual uh, magnitude of the DEMOS. So um, looking at the magnitude of the DEMOS across the time period, we can find great light curves of the DEMOS. And what do these light curves give us? Well, they can definitely first give um, the time period of mutual events. So this includes the primary occultation, which is when Dimorphous goes in front of the Deimos. Also, the secondary occultation, where um, Dimorphous, where the Deimos goes in front of Dimorphous, and also the primary eclipse, where the shadow of Dimorphous goes in front of the Deimos. So during each of these mutual events, um, you can observe a dip in light in the light curves, and using this dip, we're able to find the time period of each, each of these separate mutual events. So light curves can also reveal, reveal the rotation period of an asteroid. So, normally, asteroids are mostly not um, 
spherical in shape. Um, and this is because um, they're small enough that their gravitational pull um, is not strong enough to make them a sphere, which means that while um, the asteroid is spinning, we're able to see at some points more of the asteroid, some points less of the asteroid, as you can see in, these, in this animation. And um, from our point of view on Earth, we can observe how much reflected light we're seeing from the asteroid. And over time, we'll be able to get a curve, which will give us the rotation period of the asteroid. In this case, um, the Dimas had a rotational period of 2.26 hours before the impact. So for um, to get the light curves of the Dimas, I followed a seven step procedure. So I've already talked about these in detail at my previous presentation at RASC, but I'll go over, over them uh, quickly. So first was finding telescopes located all around the world that could image the Dimas. Um, I had to create observation plans uh, while keeping in mind that I needed to observe the DEMOS with signal to noise ratio of above 100. So I meant I had to take the magnitude of the DEMOS into account and change my exposure time accordingly. Next step was pre-processing the FITS files. So this was to extract essential information from the FITS files so I can use it in the future analysis that I'll be doing. Third was plate solving um, the image. So this is matching the objects in my image to the objects in the sky gotten from catalogs such as Gaia. And um, after that, I had to select an aperture radius for both Didymos and the comparison size. Um, so I have to be careful while doing this because if I selected too small an aperture radius, um, not all the pixels of the target object would be visible. Um, but if I selected too big an aperture, I would include lots of noise in my observations too. So I had to find like the kind of balance in between the two. The next step was finding comparison stars. So why are these useful? Um, this is because stars have a known brightness that does not change over time, so it stays constant. Um, so if there's any problems in the scene conditions, like if the weather is bad, I'll be able to know that from looking at the magnitude of um, the comparison stars. So these kind of acts like the baseline for my observations. Um, but finding comparison stars is hard because not all of them are suitable. Like some of them might be too small, some of them might have huge varying brightnesses over time. So it's really finding those five, six comparison stars in my image that will work out perfectly. The next step was actually generating the light curves of the DEMOS. Um, so a, one observation is not enough to get an accurate rotational period of the DEMOS of the DEMOS. So um, I've taken many observations and I've combined them together. The um, but one thing I take into account while I was combining my observations was that I had to offsets um, to account for the change in the phase angle and the apparent magnitude of the DEMOS. So how did the magnitude of the DEMOS change before and after the impact? So here I have plotted a graph of, in blue, you can see here the magnitude of the DEMOS as it would be without the impact. So this is computed by the NASA Horizons database. And in orange here is the magnitude with the impact, which I've computed myself from my observations. So pre-impact, you can see that my observations um, are very similar to observations from the NASA Horizons database. Um, but as you can see, right after the impact, um, there's a change in about one magnitude. Um, so the magnitude decreased by one meaning that the asteroid became significantly brighter right after the impact. And up to, up to two weeks later, it still goes um, above the expected brightness before going back um, to similar brightnesses as predicted. So my uh, um, the curve that I just showed correlates with light curves from other sources, such as the Atlas uh, photometry server and um, a virtual telescope. Um, both um, during the impact, you can see a sharp inc um, increase in the brightness um, before going back a couple of weeks later to its original brightness before. So uh, before the impact, um, combining all my observations, I was able to get a rotational period of around 2.259 hours. Um, and this is very close to the expected 2.26 hour rotation period of the DEMOS. And I was getting an amplitude of around 0.1. Amplitude is the 
total change in magnitude, um, so like the highest and lowest value, which was also correlating with the expected values. I repeated the same process post impact, um, and I found out that the rotational period did not change at all. So it stayed um, 2.2599. Um, and these are observations that I collected myself from 30th September to 20th, 26th October. So pre-impact, I was able to capture a mutual event. Um, so as you can see in the above plot, um, there's one in the blue color, which is going um, slightly below the others. So this was the mutual event, of, um, which was possibly eclipsing. Um, so post-impact, I wanted to try and measure the same things. So um, while I haven't been able to measure a definite eclipse, um, I'm still analyzing some of my observations, like from the AABSO telescope. Um, and I think there might be a, um, a mutual event inside this, but I haven't finished analyzing it, so it's still to see. So what can um, the light curve rotational period give about the asteroid composition. So most minor planets have a rotational period above 2.2 hours, um, which means it, can, it does less than 11 rotations per day. Um, but most of them actually exceed this limit by a lot by going four to 10 hours a day. Um, so why um, is this so? So um, lots of asteroids, um, especially the smaller ones, tend to be more like rubble piles with lots of rural, rural um, sorry, with lots of loose rocks around, um, which means that they're held together by mutual gravitation, which means that um, if they were to spin faster than what they're going right now, and if their rotation period were to decrease, then um, lots of pieces of these asteroids would be flung around, which is why if an asteroid is to have a rotational period of below 2.2 hours, so it's, um, spinning faster, then the asteroid has to be strand bound, otherwise it could fly apart. Um, I'm going to give a quick example here. So let's say um, there's these grapes here. So um, as you can see, if I rotate it slowly, none of the grapes are falling. But if I start to rotate it faster, some of the grapes would fall apart, like it has just done. So um, the rotational period of Didymos is 2.26 hours, which is very close to the 2.2 hour limit. So um, this means that the asteroid spins quite fast compared to other asteroids. I'm going to give a comparison of two other asteroids, Ryugu and Bennu. So Ryugu has, um, it's about the same size as Didymos with a 900 meter um, diameter, yet um, it spins every eight hours, meaning the rotational period is eight hours, and it only does about um, three rotations per day. Um, and Bennu, which has um, a much smaller diameter, also um, has a lower rotational period of about four hours, meaning that Diddy Moss falls, it definitely falls on the higher um, speed category of um, asteroids. So um, while imaging Didymos um, after the impact was, and while stacking the images, I was able to see the tail of the asteroid. And I thought it would be fun um, to do some calculations. So um, I was measuring the change, the length of the tail um, across time. So um, just measuring the length, length was using simple math calculations. So using the pixel um, scale, I was able to find the length of the tail in arc seconds. And then knowing how far um, the Dimas was to the Earth, I was able to find around a ten length tail of around 16,000, um, 167,000 km kilometers. Actually, I think I made a mistake here. It should be um, 16,000. Uh, I think I'm adding an extra digit. But um, these are my observations of the Dimas sale um, after the impact. So you can see starting here at 27 September, when the ejecta hasn't had enough time to spread around yet, the tail is quite low. Um, but at um, 30th September and 1st October, you can see that the tail end is increasing dramatically to go over 20,000 kilometers. Um, but after that, it seems to be decreasing on 11th October, 
and just to go back up again on 30th October. So um, I was quite curious about these changes because it seemed to be going up once, going down, and going, going back up again. Um, so I was looking at information from the Hubble Space Telescope, which was also observing the tail of the DEMOS, um, the DEMOS system. And it seems like um, it, it confirmed that the ejected material has, was expanding, um, creating the tail, and then faded in the brightness. But they also said that the DEMOS developed a second tail of ejectile between the 2nd and 8th October, as you can see in this GIF below. Um, and they said that similar behavior is also seen in other comets and active asteroids. So a uh, change in the dimorphous orbital period. They expected a 73% a 73 second um, decrease in the orbital period, but um, it was fast 25 times to go to 32 minutes. So why the sudden increase based on the predicted to the actual? So um, using some of my own conclusions and from what I've seen, um, first I can see that Dimorphos is more of a rubble type asteroid, um, which means it's possible that when um, dark impacted it, it led to lots of debris escaping as we have seen from the tail. But um, that means like, for example, if you take a balloon and let out lots of air, the balloon goes forward, which means that similar effects might have been seen on Dimorphos meaning it would increase the speed even more. Also, um, since less of the ejecta has escaped, it means the mass of the asteroid would be lower, meaning that um, the asteroid would be able to go faster, leading to a bigger change in the orbital period of um, Dimorphos. Um, but in the future, um, changes in the heliocenter orbit um, will, uh, from the Hera mission or anything else, will provide um, additional answers to these questions. So um, while doing the photometry, um, I had many um, challenges, especially post-impact, because post-impact, the DEMOS um, was now in a crowded star field because it was approaching near the Milky Way, meaning that many um, stars were collide, were in a path of the asteroid, meaning that um, the light curves I was getting was less accurate than pre-impact. Also, um, the asteroid is now moving towards the northern hemisphere, and my all of my telescopes that I'm observing the DEMOS from are in the southern hemisphere, meaning that I won't be able to view them for one or two hours every night. Um, but pretty fact, I was able to view them for up to four hours. Um, so um, I was not able to get as many observations, but in the future, I'll be looking for telescopes in the northern hemisphere um, so that I can get longer observations of the DEMOS. But also one other thing to take into account is that the moss is now becoming dimmer. Um, so right now it just dimmed uh, below, above 16 magnitude, um, meaning that it's much harder to get um, a simple to noise ratio of above 100, which meaning that they increase the exposure time to two minutes or more. Another thing that I noticed is even climate change is changing um, my observations because for six days in a row, um, from around September, October 17th to October 23rd, um, none of my observations came. And this is in somewhere like Siding Springs. Um, so I was really surprised. And it means that um, observing conditions are playing a big role in this. Um, right now, there is no probe or anything observing um, Dimorphos or the Moss, which means that all our observations are coming from ground-based telescopes at least till the HERA mission comes in 2026. Um, but before that time, um, now ground-based telescopes are what's needed, especially for measuring the shift in the heliocenter orbit of the Didymos system. Actually, um, someone has already been able to measure this in Spain. Um, on the 18th of October, they were able to notice um, the occultation of the Didymos asteroid. And, um, there's also more observations of the asteroid because um, actually from the Gaia telescope, because um, Gaia um, has, it takes lots of observations of the sky, meaning that um, actually on 4th November, it'll be taking images of the sky where Diddy Moss um, is actually currently. So if any of you are interested in viewing that, you can. Um, one last thing I want to mention, um, I've been also doing some just quick calculations for fun about um, the Didymos system. 
So for example, um, in the last image that showed both Dinimast and Dimorphus, I was able to calculate um, the distance between the two. So I calculated um, 1,920 meters um, as the distance. The actual was um, 1,200. Uh, also looking at the last complete image of Dimorphus on its own, um, I was able to calculate a diameter of 237 meters um, using just calculations based on the distance to the object. And um, the, well, the actual was 170 meters. And also um, looking at the images right before collision, um, I was interested in seeing how big um, the rubble was. Um, it actually came up to 10 meters, um, which is quite big. So well, all, all my calculation might have been overestimated, we'll still find it to do these. Um, if you're interested, I'll also be giving a presentation up about my post-impact observations on the 25th of September um, at an eye telescope webinar. As before, um, I've submitted all of my observations I've collected um, on the ALCDEF website so that other people can see and use my observations. I would like to thank um, people who have helped me in this project. For example, Christina Thomas from the DART um, group who has talked to me and given me lots of suggestions on my project. And also many other people like Daniel um, Parrott who has helped me throughout and given me observations, especially pre and back that I've used. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Arusha, that's an impressive undertaking and fabulous results. Well done. I sure hope you have time to do your homework uh, because you're being distracted by all this fun stuff. Um, let's go to Emma. Do we have any questions for Arushi? Uh, yes, we got a couple of questions. Uh, the first question comes in from Blake Nancaro. He wants to know, are you using the BGO, um, the Burke Gaffney Observatory in Halifax? Um, right now, I'm currently not using that telescope. I've used it in the past for imaging Apophis, I think. Um, but for, for now, Didymos, um, I have not. Um, previously, because it was not rising, Didymos was not rising in that area. But now that it's rising in the northern hemisphere, I definitely consider using the BGO telescope. Cool. Thank you. Um, this next question comes in from John's Garage. Uh, what is the composition of the asteroid? Um, that's a great question. Um, so the composition of Dimorphos is not yet known, um, but more observations will definitely lead to a more accurate um, composition of this asteroid. Great. Very cool. Thank you so much. That's um, all the questions we've gotten tonight. Great. Thank you, Emma. And thanks again, Arushi. Let's move on to our next speaker. Ron McNaughton will talk to us about the mystery of the Martian flares. I've really enjoyed an article in uh, the October Sky and Telescope on this, and uh, it just so amazed me. I decided I would put a brief talk together, uh, just a few hours to bang things together, and it's a lot more complicated than that. So here we go. Um, I'm going to do some uh, uh, digressions to uh, set the stage and then I'll tie everything in together. Uh, I lived in the Arctic and often lights would have a big glow above them called light pillars. And the explanation is that when ice crystals form uh, that are flat, and I don't know whether these are snowflakes or bigger than that, they drift horizontally. And if an observer is the same height as the uh, very light polluting fixture, uh, it's going to be the um, uh, crystals uh, roughly halfway in between and they reflect the light. And in the Arctic, we could see right down. <clears throat> My second thing I'm gonna mention is um, there's a video on the Henrietta occultation that I was part of. And uh, I had a, um, uh, a, a radio uh, that played a radio station that just gave the time beeps every second with an announcement once a month once a minute and uh, I was looking at my telescope I found a particular star that was supposed to be occulted and just to see it blink out and then I don't know 14 seconds later or so blink back in again 
it was an awesome feeling to think that an asteroid that I could drive that distance in an hour, maybe several hundred million kilometers away, caused a star to disappear. And it was just an amazing feeling that I, I'm connected with the solar system in a way that I feel when I saw the moon turning the bright sunlight in the day to darkness. And when I saw a comet moving uh, compared to background stars. Uh, a number of people um, in the center were part of observing this, uh, but people all the way from California to, I think, uh, uh, Carp uh, near Ottawa was the furthest west, and uh, I was the red one. Last uh, thing I'm going to talk about is Paul Maley at age 30. Uh, he wasn't able to drive to a major occultation on quite a bright star. Uh, 3.6 is very uh, visible naked eye. But um, he looked at it through this telescope. He sent me that picture and uh, he saw a short dip well removed from where the asteroid was. And the International Occultation Timing Association had a presentation that Guy Nason went to and they were convinced it was a satellite of the asteroid, but the professionals didn't think that could happen. And Paul stuck to his guns and said, this is what I observed. And um, uh, eventually, of course, including the, uh, the DART uh, system that uh, Arushi talked about, uh, there are lots of asteroids that have um, satellites or moons. John Milton Oford, was an amateur astronomer observing Mars in 1896, and he had the guts to describe a flare in Hellas, which is where I'm showing, that was brilliant scintillating star-like point. And maybe other people said, are you a little crazy to be saying that was true? But he did, and he stuck to his guns. Um, the October 2020 article mentioned a whole bunch of things, and I'm very briefly going to go through these. The very left column gives dates of 1937, 51, a couple in 54, and three in 58, and there are other ones as well. This is all they listed. Um, many of the observers were Japanese. Um, a number of observations were brighter than the polar cap, which means it could easily be seen naked eye if Mars weren't there. And it lasted roughly five minutes and the first, second, um, fifth and sixth ones were all like that. And there were some that were less bright than the ice cap and were only a few seconds or a minute and sometimes repeated. So my takeaways, these are real events, but they're rare. They're bright, usually, but all, not, always, not always five minutes. And the EDOM one, Promontorium, however you say it, is different. And these place names are no longer used. When I looked them up Googling, there was no link. Or in the alternative, uh, the only link was to an article about Mars flare observations. Um, I think there's a reason, and I'm going to go back to Shia Pirelli's uh, 1877 surface map of Mars, and he got so many details wrong. Sew this up, he thought this was a sea, it's actually the highlands uh, and the oldest uh, surface of Mars. Uh, Hellas is a great big um, uh, crater, uh, huge, huge basin, and he shows something going down the middle. He has all sorts of channels that the Latin or the Italian word is canali. Uh, that others translated into canals, and so many details were wrong. And my suspicion is that they saw features that were not um, uh, found to be true in modern maps based on satellite observations, uh, uh, especially Mariner 9. Um, this is an all Mars uh, projection from Wikipedia, and the colors refer to different geologies. And I'm going to zoom in from the volcanoes to Hellas here. And this is Hellas uh, Basin. Uh, very close to the equator is Shia Pirelli Crater. And uh, that's where uh, the Martian was going to in that wonderful movie. Uh, this is zero latitude, and I don't know why it's zero longitude. And this is Valles Marineris. And my guess is it's probably carried more water per second than any other water course in the solar system's history. It flooded the north part of the uh, planet. 
and uh, nobody could see it from Earth. It was only discovered when the uh, Mariner 9 spacecraft went in orbit around Mars, and then they had to wait for a dust storm to, to them and hear the volcanoes. Eventually, with Chris Trace's help, I found um, uh, hints of where these uh, different things are. So Edom Promontorium is very much around Chaparelli uh, Crater. Uh, and the other two are uh, in this area. And these are pretty hilly areas with many uh, valleys, etc. So what causes flares? One idea is Martians are just playing with us, having fun. Another idea is that they were trying to send a signal. After Hiroshima, uh, some people speculated that maybe the flares were caused by atomic explosions. Some people suggested volcanism. And uh, this uh, uh, volcanoes have low surface brightness. Even the hot gases that come out that uh, killed everybody in Pompeii, for instance, that has low surface brightness. And you would need a huge area for this to happen. And how it could start and stop in five minutes, I don't know. Somebody suggested maybe it's ice crystals in the atmosphere that are oriented in the Martian atmosphere. That's what caused the light pillars. When you look at it from above like an airplane, sometimes you see the sun is above this picture and behind it. Um, the sunlight comes down and it seems to form a long band because this is reflected over a deep depth of uh, reflecting things. And maybe that is what caused the um, reflections on the Mars. So I've made this diagram showing Mars. And if we look at it, the very center of Mars is the sub-Earth point. The sub-Sun point is where it's vertical and sometimes they're close, but if uh, you're looking from above the North Pole, uh, one planet is ahead of the other. In this case, Earth is ahead, and it can be a significant angle between them. Uh, or it can be looking from the side, and even during a opposition when their uh, Sun, Earth, and Mars are a straight line, uh, you're going to find one of them is often a little above the other because the two planet orbits are tilted compared to each other. You would expect if it's caused by something that's horizontal, like the um, uh, crystals in the uh, the ice uh, crystals in the uh, sky floating down, that the reflection would be halfway in between, but often it isn't. So the source has to be sloping. And one theory gets turfed out the drain, although maybe it did apply in some cases and you need a, um, uh, maybe there's a sloping reflector on the ground. Is it ice? This was included in the article. And if that's ice, it's pretty rough. And I've seen the Columbia Glacier and it's pretty rough. And if somebody points a mirror so that a sunlight is right in my eyes, it only takes a tiny angle of change before it's no longer. And the planet rotates about a little over a degree every five minutes, and that would be enough to have a bright flare and then nothing uh, after five minutes. And somebody calculated that several football fields of area would be enough to uh, create the light, the brightness that we see if it were really reflective. If it's diffuse, such as a piece of paper or a paper towel, you can change the direction of it and it looks equally bright. Another idea is rocks of Mars and various uh, orbiters around Mars look down and they take uh, infrared spectra, and it reveals the types of rocks. And according to the October um, Sky and Tell, uh, they're unusually rich in feldspars um, uh, in the areas where they've been observed. And feldspar has a reflecting plane sometimes. Now, I think these are fingers holding it, which means this is a pretty tiny thing. Um, D.W. Rosebrook, I'm going to get to what he did. He was in this picture from 1921. So my guess is if he was at university then, he was born somewhere around 1900. He submitted some articles to the uh, RESC journal. And uh, he's written about astronomy. But other than that, I know very little about him. But he's quoted in the Sky and Tell article. Uh, 
being at the rocky shore of Lake Huron, then there were many feldspar faults, perhaps 30 feet wide and hundreds of feet long. And he said they're quite shiny if viewed from a suitable angle, but if viewed from other angles, they appear darker. Um, both geologists I talked to said that it would be a dike, not a fault, but that's a minor thing. I have a friend who's taken me sailing from Midland up to Perry Sound, stopping in many places, uh, anchoring and then taking the Zodiac to shore and wandering around. And he and his wife have spent many weeks up in northern Georgian Bay, uh, Killarney, going all the way to Manitoulin, i.e. Lake Huron. And he's never seen anything close to what was described there. I don't know if uh, maybe uh, Roseboro was looking when Sudbury had uh, pollution from Sudbury had killed all the trees. This might have been the 50s or 60s. Who knows? Anyway, he, uh, my friend Bill sent me a picture of quartzite, but nothing about uh, uh, the other. Um, then I found another article by Dobbins and Sheehan, and they're the same people that wrote the Sky and Telescope article. And uh, this is from the Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, uh, ALPO. And if you Google that, you can find it. And it's somewhere around 2000 and, and a bit. And one of the theories he mentioned is, could there be fog in valleys? And maybe frost could form on surfaces and they could be really reflective. And this whole thing is also done as a York University study. So I made some diagrams, just roughly. Um, apparently, this is relatively rare on flat areas because the moist ground air mixes with drier upper area and you get relatively little fog. But in valleys, you get more moist air. And sometimes this is supposed to be frost here. And maybe that's a reflective layer. Who knows? Uh, another possibility is that it's a crater. Um, and the Edom site maybe is like this because they have various uh, reflective moments and then not so. And it could be there are a series of um, relatively flat areas, but that are tilted that are causing reflections as the rotation of Mars takes the surface to the right. Anyway, uh, they predicted there would be a flare in Edom Promontorium on June 9th in 2001. The alignment of the planet and everything was right. So a whole bunch of people went down to the Florida Keys where the weather would be good and Mars high. Looking through the, uh, this is a 12 inch uh, telescope with a uh, video camera connected to it. And they had, I think it's six days of nothing. And then on June 7th, they saw a flare at uh, 2.40 a.m. local time. And on June 8th, they saw two. Here's a video and there's the flare and it's less pronounced there. Although uh, if they can do this again, better video cameras will get better values and this has north up. Um, I wonder if some university might have a telescope where they could spend an evening where it's likely to be around and take spectrum of the flares and that might tell us something about a possible cause. Anyway, Dobbins and Sheehan made a prediction in the Sky and Telescope article, and they were saying on these dates, and I haven't done it yet, but I will send a post to the Toronto Center email group with uh, this information. And these are the times, and I worked out Mars altitude and degrees, and it goes 36 minutes later every day. So by the 7th of December, it's pretty low in the sky. So that's not very uh, good for observing. But I looked at another source from the Alpole, and they say that the flares are going to be 72 minutes, and now we're actually in 11 minutes earlier. And they have these predicted times, which are slightly higher. And there, of course, patterns tend to continue. So it could be that in days before, if you just follow the patterns, it's going to be earlier. I'm again going to give all this information. Um, who knows the date, whether it's going to happen or not, but these are the same conditions of alignment of Mars and us and the sun and that particular part of it. And they're predicting another pattern. And um, the area that's expected is just north of Schiapelli Parelli Crater. 
And I plan, if the weather is good, and early December is not the greatest weather in Toronto area, but if the weather's good like it's been here, I intend to set up and observe. And if I'm looking through my scope and I see a flare, I'm going to feel a real connection to another part of our solar system. And my whoop of excitement will probably wake up the neighborhood. Anyway, thank you very much. And I'd love if anybody has any questions. Ron, thank you for bringing this to our attention. I was not aware of this. Uh, so uh, we'll try and keep an eye, uh, eye out for it uh, if the weather cooperates. Um, do we have any questions for Ron? Um, no, we didn't get any questions tonight. OK. Ron, uh, let us know how you make out uh, through the email list, please. Yeah, well, I'll, uh, I'll let people know. Um, uh, I'm not as able to handle really cold conditions as I used to be, in part mm -hmm. because I got partial frostbite on a wild goose chase that Guy Nason led us on to observe another uh, occultation. So uh, I, might, uh, I might only do it a few times, but I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Okay. Very good. Thanks again, Ron. So that concludes the speakers for this evening. Um, I'll call on uh, Tom Luden, our president, and, uh, next uh, to take care of the announcements for this evening. Okay. So thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. Thank you to all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, we got quite a bit of announcements, so uh, let's get through it. First, some really good news. It's time. It's awards season. We've got quite a few people uh, who have worked very hard over the last year and deserve quite a bit of recognition. So uh, I'm just gonna be going through here. So first up, we have the Charlene Nordgrove Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Toronto Center. And we have two winners, Brianna Horvatten and Richard Sewards. I'm just gonna quickly read off the um, citation. Brianna Horvatten, an active volunteer with the RASC Toronto Centre for the past 20 years, has been assisting with her parents at public star parties at the Ontario Science Centre, including the uh, famous 2003 Mars Fest event, International Year of Astronomy in 2009, and a large number of uh, school star parties. Brianna has assisted with public outreach at the CAO, starting with the annual L.E. Shore Library event more than 20 years ago, with probus groups and volunteering at uh, OHAP celebrations. Brianna has attended many work parties at the CAO, and continues to assist primarily with the lawn cutting, all, much of which she has done herself these past two years due to COVID-19 restrictions. Brianna has a love of astronomy and of helping others, which we feel makes her an ideal nominee for the Charlene Nordgrove Award. Richard Sewers, an active, a volunteer active in mentoring others, especially with his agreement to serve as our after hours resource person in the SLO, the Sue Laura Observatory, and many, many nights of mentoring fellow members when he was imaging with the uh, GBO, the Jeff Brown Observatory. And he is a great asset uh, as part of the CAO committee. The Andrew Elvins Award for Promotion of Astronomy goes to the members of the Durham Education and Outreach Group. So um, these folks have been running the program at Millennium Square in Pickering for the last several years. This was the first in-person outreach program to resume after pandemic restrictions were relaxed by the government. And um, as a result, for the last six months, they have been the major public face of the Toronto Centre. Uh, the group represents an effective astronomy program to several thousand residents over the last several months uh, in the Pickering and Durham area. Next up, the Bertram J. Topham Award for Observing goes to Chris Vaughn. In recognition of his, his observing activity throughout the pandemic, he earned his MESSE certificate in January of 2019, the finest NGC object certificate and double star certificate 
in December of 2021. Chris also frequently posts about his observing activities on the Toronto Centre email forum, as well as the Rascals list. He contributes articles to Sky News and distributes his weekly astronomy skylights to a worldwide audience. The Ray Thompson Award for Astronomical Imaging goes to Manu Mukherjee. And I, Mukherjee, I apologize. I know I've uh, stumbled over that. Uh, this is in recognition of his frequent posts of images of deep sky objects to the Toronto Centre Forum and his online comments supporting other imagers. Uh, he also helps other imagers when he attends sessions at the Glen Manger Forest and at the EC Carr Astronomical Observatory. The Ostrander Ramsey Award for Astronomical Writing is nominated by the scope editor, Eric Briggs, and this year, the winner is Blake Nancaro. Uh, um, one of the most outstanding pieces of writing by a Toronto Center member was uh, Blake's item in Sky News about 3D printing in Hacking Your Scope in the July August 2021 issue, he described how he used the 3D printer to construct parts to replace or enhance components of his various telescopes and mounts. Uh, he's a regular contributor to the Journal of the RASC with his column Binary Universe and serves on the Society of Observing Committee. His article in Sky News brings his technological expertise to a wider audience in an entertaining and informative way. And last but certainly not least is the H.A. Winner's Award for Service, also known as the President's Award. Now, this award is long, long overdue. Uh, part of the reason why is we had to wait a little while until someone was no longer as closely associated with the awards committee. We had to wait until Tony Horvatin, uh had moved on away from the awards committee before we could award this, give this award, to Grace Horvatin. Grace has been one of the most important, most reliable, and hardest working volunteers of the RAS Toronto Center for many, many years. Um, from the early years of operations at EC Carr, uh, the CAO, she has been a member of the CAO committee. She helps to organize work weekends and has acted as a cook at work parties for over 20 years. Grace has also contributed to major events of the CAO, such as our open houses. Uh, she's played an important role in the series of annual astronomy presentations at Thornbury's, L Thornbury's L.E. Shore Public Library and the subsequent tours of the CAO for Thornbury residents. She was also a major contributor to events held at the DDO during the Toronto Centre's stewardship of the site following its sale by the U of T. Grace is one of those volunteers who contributes wholeheartedly to the RASC along across a wide range of activities, and without her, the center would be a much poorer place. So thank you and congratulations to all the award winners tonight. So uh, moving on, I'd like to welcome everyone here who's joined us tonight. Uh, as Paul mentioned earlier, we have two types of meetings. This was one of our recreational astronomy nights. And we also have coming up in two weeks, one of our speaker nights. Uh, if you're watching us live, please use the YouTube chat as others have done so. Uh, say hello, enter some questions for presenters. If you're a new member, uh, introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far away, let us know where you're from. For example, I'm speaking to you from my couch here in downtown Toronto. So um, speaking of speakers nights, we're actually having a take two. If you were with, with us for our last speakers night, we had quite a few technical problems, uh, namely two computer failures and an internet connection that decided to go south on us. So one advantage of being online is that it's not that difficult to have a, re, uh, a take two. So on Tuesday, the 8th of November at 7.30 p.m. here on YouTube, uh, Jabavu Jabba Adams from York University will be talking again about always looking, always learning from amateur astronomy to computing and back again. 
please join us for this. And then our regularly scheduled speakers night meeting is on Wednesday, the 16th of November at 7.30 p.m. Ismail Moumin of the Université Laval and the Canada-France-Hawaii Telescope will be talking about observation of galaxies in the era of 3D spectroscopy. Coming up on December 7th is our next Recreational Astronomy Night and our annual meeting. And for the first time since March of 2020, we are going to be live at the Ontario Science Centre. 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday, December 7th. Chris Vaughn will be talking about the sky this month. And Alex Argemant and Charles Young will be reporting on the... App, reporting on the 2022 annual Algonquin adventure. Immediately following uh, the RAN will be the annual, the yearly annual meeting. And uh, that moment, at this moment, I'd like to invite you to join us. The, there will be an online Zoom meeting right after the December RAN. Um, it will be a hybrid meeting, so you can either attend in person or you can call in via Zoom. Invitations will be emailed out shortly. The agenda, last year's minutes, and the slate of council candidates will be on our website. Um, you must register for this meeting, even if you will be intending to arrive and uh, to, to visit in person, with the registration occurring no later than 12 midnight on the 5th of December. Um, we're asking everyone to register um, if for no other, just to get an idea of how many folks we have coming. And as well, being the 7th of December, bad weather is a possibility. And if you do not receive an invitation by the middle of next week, and you're a member of good standing, please drop me a line at president at rasktio.ca. Also now is the call for nominations for council. Anyone wishing to join uh, must be a member in good standing, and the nomination form requires the signatures of two additional members. The deadline for nominations is Wednesday, November 23rd at midnight Eastern Standard Time. Uh, please send all your nominations to the secretary, secretary at raskto.ca. Uh, a little more detail about our meeting plans coming up into coming up into the new year so RAN meetings will be the first wednesday of each month at the ontario science center in the gemini east room um we might move around once or twice but the gemini east is our anticipated home for the time being until repairs are made to the bridge and we can get back into studio two uh the meetings will still be also be online which means that hosts and presenters and audience members can join remotely. If we have bad weather, uh, this means that the meeting will switch to online only, and we do not intend to cancel uh, the meeting outright like we did back in the pre-COVID days. Um, for the time being, speaker nights will remain completely online. Um, Elena has gotten us speakers from so many places around the globe um, that having someone uh, visit us to talk in person may not happen for a little while. And so unless um, folks would absolutely demand that we open up the room in the Science Center and have a live audience watching the screen, we will keep this online for the time being. Coming up at the DDO in the next little while, on Sunday, November the 6th, is Ask an Astronomer uh, with award-winning Chris Vaughn uh, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, there's a $5.65 registration fee. The links can be found at rasto.ca. Uh, Astronomy Speakers Night on Saturday, November the 12th, 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Mahid Hemani will be discussing astronomical research at the undergraduate level. With a $12.76 registration fee. Again, links at rasto.ca. And then Sunday, Sunday sun gazing on November the 13th, 1230 to 1 p.m. Uh, with a $6.92 registration fee. Again, links at rasto.ca. 
uh, the next City Star Party is the first clear night of the week of November the 28th uh, at Bayview Village Park. I understand we had a successful session last night. And, uh, Dark Sky Star Parties are still location and date to be determined. At the CAO, um, access to CAO facilities by members and families only in a modified communal fashion with a total site occupancy limited to 25 individuals. Upstairs washroom is only for upstairs bookings. The max occupancy for the upstairs bedrooms is two people from the same family per bedroom for a total of six. Communal areas are limited to three people with masks. All CAO users can use both kitchens, downstairs washrooms while wearing masks. Full details on the website. Please read before you make your bookings. Oh, sorry. I've neglected to add one note. With our switch to online meetings, um, we recommend members wear masks, but that will not be enforced. Coming up, uh, we're also looking for some volunteers. Uh, we're still trying to find an education and public outreach chair. Um, we are looking for a light pollution committee chair. We're looking for a volunteer committee chair. And we're looking for a marketing committee chair and some committee members. Our AV committee is always looking for additional help. Uh, EPO committee is looking for additional members, especially folks uh, who can present online and who can be telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. A reminder that in order to be a volunteer, you first must be a Toronto Center member. A uh, quick reminder that it is uh, membership renewal season. You can renew it online at secure.rask.ca. There is a Rask emergency fund and gift memberships are also available at mempub at rask.ca. If you've been trying to contact them recently and had difficulty, um, national office, uh, the membership uh, publication coordinator uh, recently stepped down and a new person is moving in to fill that role uh, shortly. So if you've contacted them, uh, be patient, perhaps send another email within the next week. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media that we've got listed here. If you like what you saw tonight, uh, please like and subscribe and click the notification bell. Uh, be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everybody.